take the first question, Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Sander, I'm Deputy Protection Commissioner. And thank you all for your presentations. Thank you, Sim, especially for outlining what you're doing in Estonia. I'm pleased to say I'm traveling to Estonia next week for your data protection <laughs> conference, so I'm very excited <laughs> after seeing that. Um, I think it's very positive, progressive what you're doing. Um, and I was really interested to hear you say, talk about trust of citizens and transparency mm -hmm. for citizens. I think the debate we've had in Ireland over the last week draws out the, the, the essential mm -hmm. aspect of transparency about how data is collected, processed, and used across government for very legitimate reasons, which, which you've ta talked to us about. Uh, and that's where, as a, the regulator here in Ireland, we're coming from. So I wonder, could you elaborate a little bit further about how you achieve that transparency for the citizen, please? Mm -hmm. Well, it all starts really from, uh, I guess, the principle that we all actually are to sh share, right? Which is really that people always own the data. Us as governments, we're only custodians, right? In a particular information system setting. Um, and for us, that meant a few things. Well, first of all, exactly, we said, okay, well, what's the, how to actually make this happen? That it wouldn't be just a, let's say, high-flying high legal principle and, you know, and I could effectively get that sort of, you know, uh, uh, I could get it effective through the weeks of procedure through data protection agencies. But actually, get, is it actually a technical trick? We could also uh, enable this immediately. And that's why we built it into the systems themselves. Yes, in my health record, in our patient portal, I can go in and I can, so exactly, there's a logbook function. I see who has been, let's say, looking into my data and stuff. If I then have a problem with it, then I go exactly to your colleagues in the country and, and the regular process follows. Similarly, um, in our case, of course, we do also have to follow that data can only be used if, um, you know, uh, for a specific purpose. But then again, we've used the law a lot to define the purpose a bit more widely, perhaps. And, and that's also what we see like a public consent. If the regulation allows us for you know, data sharing, uh, then exactly we'll, then we have a good legal framework to do that with, right? But secondly, we, we then give still people the option to opt out. If they don't like it happening, again, you know, they can go, basically go into uh, online service themselves and, and stop this. Very briefly, in, in our electronic health record, again, for example, um, for every medical you know, bit and bit about my case, I can say, block this to the next doctor, or block this to my wife, <laughs> even better. <laughs> so, uh, because she, you know, in my case, she has the authorization to view my things and act on my behalf, if necessary. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I have the actual effective control, bit by bit, in that sense, you know, what is, what is really happening with my data. Mm -hmm. So that sort of, Okay. is where we come from and, and then yeah, how we like that uh, we, we now like to bring this to all of the data the government has about us exactly in the GDPR sort of fashion and sense. Barry, would you like to come in there? Yeah, um, I think, I, I guess one of the difficulties about the debate that we've had this week is it's a little bit chicken and egg. I mean, you have to earn the right to share citizens' data and you have to earn their trust. And where we're trying to go with the government strategy is exactly along the road that uh, Estonia have travelled and, uh, and, and, and other countries across Europe. The people should be able to log on to a portal <coughs> using their MyGov ID and see all the data that we hold about them and how that data has been used. Unfortunately, because the argument has been either not fully articulated or improperly represented, take your pick. We have a situation where people don't understand that this is actually a driver to achieve that. So when you hear people writing in the papers or saying in the media, but I know a case of a guard looking at information that they should have done or someone in welfare looking at the information they should have done, they're losing the point that it's the ability to, to create an audit trail of those accesses will stop those people looking at data and will therefore increase that level of trust. Um, I used to think it was very ironic that all the major data breaches came from manual systems and yet the view of the public they've been led to believe is that joining up data electronically will actually increase the number of data breaches but yet we don't really get electronic data breaches and we don't get them where the systems are fully transparent mm -hmm. and that's where we've got to go to. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Owen O'Dell. I'm an Associate Professor of Law in Trinity. I had what I thought was a very good question, but Dale just asked. <laughs> so I'm going instead to ask uh, two small questions. One to Paul, uh, just picking up Barry's point, which is um, 
Uh, how have the rest of the Nordics and Baltics responded to the recent data breaches claiming two government ministers in Sweden? And uh, secondly, a question uh, for Sim, which is, um, uh, is there something to be said that Estonia was able to do what it did because of its, its size, that the, it was able to do it because it was small? that it would have been a much harder job to do if it were bigger, and that's why perhaps it hasn't happened in Sweden, sorry, in Finland, the example that you gave, uh, and why it might be so difficult to make it happen a um, 100 times bigger or 200 times bigger on the mm -hmm. EU scale. Mm -hmm. So data breach in Sweden, and how mm -hmm. do you grow um, from Estonia bigger? The question to me was about Sweden. Sweden. Yeah. No, I, I, I think we, I mean, uh, all our countries have uh, both discussions and challenges and there have been uh, media reports on breaches that uh, have been, that shouldn't have been there. We've had our, uh, in the health sector uh, discussions about outsourcing of uh, mm -hmm. information. Uh, is this patient information or not? How many people have seen it? Would it be safer to do it in the country uh, and not outside? Uh, what are the rules and regulations on this? Uh, so that I think we, it's, it's a trust challenge for our government because although I agree completely that uh, things are basically safer in, in a managed electronic system where you have implemented uh, these uh, security safeguards, the perception is that, uh, that uh, changing things uh, creates a new risk and it's becoming more complicated and it's our job uh, to gain the trust and to show that uh, we, and not make the mistakes too. Uh, I mean, we, and, and when they happen, be completely open and, and transparent when it comes to what has happened and what we are going to do uh, about it. Well, one side of having a, an election uh, next week is that there's now a debate at home on uh, data breaches when it comes to election security. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do not have the uh, Estonian system of, uh, we've decided not to have that because we want people to be in the voting booths, but mm. there is equipment connected to the uh, internet for counting uh, the pieces of paper and so on. And in a way, it's a bit lucky we don't have completely electronic elections now because there have been raised some questions on, uh, on the security in the counting system. So I think the last decision now is that there will be a manual count in addition to the electronic count to be completely sure. All the experts on security, or most of them, say that the risk is low. This is a kind of a, a chain of different things and very, very much uh, has to go wrong for there to be a major problem. And then you would see it because there would be something strange with the results. But I mean, th this is a trust thing and it's, it's getting, getting uh, more and more important for us to convince people that this is, uh, this is uh, safe. And, and I mean, we, we have to do that. Uh, and I think we'll be completely able to do it. Uh, and, and of course, the, 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 the consequences when something goes wrong, it's easy for IT people to say that, well, it's safer than the manual system. The consequences when things are wrong are more dramatic in, in an, uh, a digital system because you can, uh, it can reach very widely in a very short uh, time. So, I th yeah, all our governments are very into cyber security at the moment and working you know, on that. Thank you, Paul. Stay here. Just very briefly continue and I get to the the second question you had. No, but I think uh, in a good way, at least when it comes to exactly the, say, the CIO community among countries, we all try to learn from each other's mistakes as well, right? So mm -hmm. we are keen in, let's say, actually trying to sort of see ex the things that went wrong in Sweden or other places. And I mean, not commenting on Sweden now, but overall what we see, and this is a, a more general point, I mean, usually incidents happen not because of technological failures, although they can happen too, but it's really, let's say, human errors or, or even sort of lack of, uh, lack of uh, how to say, lack of right activity or, or basically exactly it's something they neglect to do, right? That's one cry. that's one cry. And I mean, for us, it was crazy that, you know, the other island next door uh, was so badly infected. Just upgrade the bloody Windows environment, mm. <laughs> for example. Yes, yeah. so, um, so that's that. Um, okay, so the second point. Um, the interesting thing is that when we actually look at governments, especially, I would argue, of course, in European Union setting, we are actually very similar size in terms of the functions we carry out, so the things we do. And I mean, the reason why I feel bold to say this is that we work with a number of countries, you know, exchange practice and experience. And again, taking the UK, for example, when they mapped their services out, when uh, GDS on the Cabinet Office was in full swing, 
then you know we took a look and we compared. Actually, we run about the same number of things we do, right? So and so so, so the scale of our operations in, in the sort of uh, or the scope of them. So that means effectively the digitization challenge, you know, the processes we have to change is very similar. The difference that the size gives is the number of lines in the database, and that's pure computing power. But size might also mean other things. The bigger the country, usually the more complex the governance. Yeah. And the complexity of decision making is really what does the trick and the change, mm -hmm. right? So how easy it is to basically agree on things. Uh, uh, and, and secondly, I guess and the other factor is that so yeah, how much is there a willingness to take risks, what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you know, to try things out, even if on a limited scale, uh, mm -hmm. and then get going from there, right? Mm -hmm. So that I see is a bigger differentiator, yeah. Uh, readiness basically to make decisions and the risk appetite that goes with that or not. Johnny, yep. Thanks. Yuan, my name is Johnny Ryan. I work at a company called PageFair. It's um, hopefully a progressive ad tech company. Those <laughs> words don't always go together. Um, I have a question that's a design question. Uh, I think it's, it's also a privacy question, and it comes from both GDPR and the e-privacy regulation. In the GDPR, there is scope for the Commission to adopt a delegated act on iconography. And this is supposed to produce standardized icons that, it, that educate the public about their rights and should, in theory, make the user experience of actually having real privacy choices work across the web. So I, I'm getting into a detail. I recognize it's a small detail. Um, I can see from inside the online uh, media and advertising industry that there's, I think, a movement in the direction of the industry being quite happy to come up with bad, uh, bad options. <laughs> Just like with the e-privacy directive. They'll be quite happy if there are things that don't work very well but work just enough. Mm -hmm. And if, if one were to wait for industry to come up with solutions to the iconography huge design challenge that could make the web work or not work, one would be waiting a long time. And so what I wonder is, um, rather than wait for them to complete their game of chicken, which they're now playing, um, what is happening there? And, and it seems to me that the, the success of GDPR and partly, uh, actually majorly, of the privacy regulation when it appears is going to rely on this design challenge. And that would be a very, very good focus for people to be thinking and talking about six months ago. And may, maybe they are, but no one I know in industry is aware of it, and I'm not either. And I, I know it's a detail, but I think right. it's important. But you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, uh, I have to. Thanks, John. <laughs> I have to now um, audit my memory whether I actually yeah. <laughs> have all the articles in my place. Um, I mean, it was more of a comment than uh, a question. I, w I would agree in the in the sense that both both what the GDPR and e privacy uh, want to do is that they want to enforce privacy by design, essentially, and these are the measures that we, we try to push. The fact that uh, by design browsers are set in a way that they protect people's private data. And people have always right to opt out from these settings, but they then need to make a click somewhere. Some service providers won't like it because mm -hmm. they think that it hinders the ability that they now have uh, uh, set up their market designs to, I don't know, advertise gather money from advertisements or whatever. But I think the main principle should be non-changeable, that we, that we have privacy by design. We can talk about the technical details, how to make it work. Uh, I'm not the one who believes that Europe as an entity should now come up with uh, privacy markers. I think it would be best if, 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 if private sector itself uh, could, uh, could self-regulate uh, and, and perhaps think about something. But, but we have the ability and in, the, in the GDPR to, to act if, if private sector does not do that. And you call it uh, uh, a chicken game. We'll see. I mean, we still have a bit less than a year when GDPR kicks in. What we are now trying to do is to make sure that once the deadline 
is reached, then it isn't like, you know, you know okay, we should, we should start running, but actually the track is not there. The track should be there. In, in this sense, you're right. And, and, and I think what we are now looking very keenly uh, this autumn is the, the science from industry, how they, they plan to, uh, to implement these minor details. But I think you're right, very important details for a, ba for a basic user uh, so that they can, whenever, whenever they go and roam in, in the digital space, that they, they have these markers that they understand that, okay, uh, now if I do this, you know, I, I give a bit more away than, than in another track. Thanks, Jorn. I have four more questions. That gentleman there, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting uh, presentations. My name is Declan DC, uh, consultant with the World Bank, former director in the Commission in the Informatics Directorate General, where I was responsible for corporate information systems and the ESA program, including EIF. I have a question for Mr. Lavazer. For data, for free movement of data, a fundamental issue is that it has a solid legal basis, the same as the other four freedoms. That implies treaty change. How is Mr. Ansip going to address this issue? Second question is how important next year will be in terms of trust and security not only for the general data protection regulation, but also for EID and authentication service regulation. Both of these will come into force, and these will be fundamental pillars for the trust and security of the digital economy. So my question is, is the Commission preparing an awareness raising and communication policy campaign for the general public on these two regulations? And the question could also be answered by Barry and Sim. And the third question relates to the once-only principle. Because at the end of the day, once-only implies national base registries, uh, in ter which have really important criteria in terms of uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of these base registries, for sharing across border in particular. Mm -hmm. And to what extent are these base registries being implemented in terms of your data policies and your information infrastructure policies in the three states that are represented here today. So would you okay. like to, as briefly as you I'll can. I'll do very quickly. Yeah. Uh, Vice President has not in his mind to, to uh, propose that we should change the treaties because the, the principles of free movement of data are already there through the principle of free movement of services, free, the freedom of establishment, etc. It's the issue of uh, implementing these treaty principles in the digital era. So we, we don't see that we need to change the treaties. What we need to do is to implement the principles okay. in the digital era as if it were, they were there. Okay. I, can, I can pick up from this again. I mean, as Estonians, we also speak about an exact effectively the fifth freedom. Right? Also, in our <laughs> case, we are not speaking that's to go to the treaties. Rather, we are seeing that there's so many practical things we can actually do to make it effective, right? As a as a freedom like that. Um, second question was about the EID, uh, and so I can say from our government perspective, we don't wait for the Commission to act on this. That's our job. I mean, mm. it's our job really to make sure that you know EID is there in the country mm. and used right away, and people are aware about this. So we are indeed in in the, in the sort of planning and sort of you know going through how to make this understandable, especially because. I have to say that on the ADAS it gets a bit more complicated compared to what we used to have domestically. But that's fine, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, trade-off. Third thing, um, as in Estonian case, for us the answer is easy. I mean, we basically work like base registers anyway. For us, every registry essentially is a base registry. Uh, in, in the, because conceptually it's built up this way, that there's a single source of truth, uh, each one of them. So, and, uh, and the last point is that but that's exactly one of the points of, among many in the declaration for e-government ministers uh, through the presidency that we tried them, <coughs> them to say, okay, we'll start working in this direction. Michael Walsh is my name. I'm a graphic designer living in Estonia, regionally Irish. Uh, a question for Barry Lowry. Uh, given that the Estonian system is based on everybody having an ID number from birth and an email address from birth, an ID card with a digital signature and having broadband throughout the country, 
how long do you think it will be before there will be broadband in rural Ireland and that the Irish would be willing to accept an ID card? How many decades? One or two? Briefly. Um, Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I got to finish. Sorry, I'm going to take the three together. Do you mind because of the time? That gentleman there and then Dale. Thank you very much uh, to the panel for some very, very interesting presentations. Sim, a question for you. Although I would say living in Belgium, uh, complexity of government is not necessarily commensurate with size of the country. Um, uh, if you were, as you introduced your presentation, actually fitting into Barry's shoes right now and you were advising the Irish government to try something out along the Estonian lines that you mentioned, you said try it out, see how it goes, what one measure that Estonia has implemented, yeah. would you go for? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Dale, the last question. It's just a, actually a quick point of information, picking okay. up on Johnny's issue about privacy design and icons. I can okay. just give an update from the Article 29 Committee of the European Data Protection Authorities. We're drafting a paper at the moment on transparency, which is we hope to cover some of those issues. Ireland is actually leading on the drafting of that paper, what it means to apply, uh, what the transparency principle under GDPR means. And also next week, we understand the presidency of the working group will uh, announce a industry consultation fab lab session in Brussels um, in the coming period. So just a small point of information, which yeah. might be of interest to you, Johnny. Th thanks, Dale. So there's two questions. Barry, you're, you're the first one. How long? <laughs> How long? Bra broadband. Well, you, you're asking, I guess, two different questions. I mean, obviously, the, the, the broadband issue, Michael, is one that, you know, the government's working through. It. Kieran's here. Um, there's plans to address that. But obviously, there's many infrastructure questions being asked of the government and many demands on, on the overall budget. My minister would require me to say that. So, you know, the answer is as fast as we can go. That's not a satisfactory answer, I know. But... Um, you know, there has been substantial progress made. There's work going on with the telecoms companies in Ireland to maintain that level of progress. Kira may want to pick up on that after I've spoken. In terms of the actual um, card itself, this is about persuasion. Um, it will not be legislated in this country to demand people to have a public service card. Now, let's get into the semantics because that was the big issue this week. Obviously, more and more state services will require a person to use MyGov ID and to get a MyGov ID they'll need a um, PSE card. So over a period of time a large and growing proportion of the population will have a PSE card. Now people have used the term by force. Um, we've carried out an awful lot of public consultation in the 18 to 34 bracket over 80% of the people absolutely support the concept of a public service card. Not surprisingly, because they're the people who've already yes. given privacy details to Amazon, Google, right. you name it. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to see a, a, a voluntary take up of this. I mean, even in the last three days, the um, entrails have been overwhelmed with people going to get their public service cards. I think mm. an element of that is actually people voting with their feet um, and saying, well, we believe it's a good idea, now we're going to go and get them. So um, <coughs> we're going to get to a point, I think, where we're going to probably get close to saturation in the right way, and that's through having a compelling argument <laughs> and persuading people that it's the right thing to do. And I think we've seen in the last two or three days a lot of people standing up saying that they mm. believe that too. Thanks, Barry. And your one uh, well, your given, piece of good advice. <laughs> given how, let's say, keen we are on data sharing, of course, I would first be inclined to say, look, I mean, you know, it's like <coughs> go strongly here with data sharing and so do the governance and the legal framework and figuring out the platforms for that, right? Uh, but actually, um, the biggest thing, the biggest impact through the years that we have seen came from electronic signatures. I mean, we mm -hmm. save, uh, well, we sort of estimate at the back of the envelope that we save at least a work week for every employed person just by signing things digitally throughout the whole economy, not just mm -hmm. within and with the government. So, th and that, by the way, signatures and the ability to do that electronically is so essential also, again, for the digital single market to work. That's why ADAS is there, that, you know, if there are digital signatures, we can, you know, cross-use them, but they have to be there. <laughs> So basically in that sense, you know, I'm cheering also for that part to become part of the plan as, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kieran, a whole bunch of Department of Communications. Um, 
I guess Sam has talked about um, how how quick it is to get through an online application in Estonia. I think congrats to all the speakers that you're going to say it in terms of what we got through today in yeah. terms of a, a very short presentation. Fantastic. In terms of broadband, really clear government policy. It's 100% of people with access to high-speed broadband. 2015, we were at 51% in Ireland. End of next year, we'll be at 77%. And of those, on the question of rural Ireland, 300,000 of them will have access to fibre to the home of a product will be, say, 150 megabits per second. And by 2020, we'll be past 90%. So uh, we're in the procurement process. Mm. This month, we get the detailed solutions from bidders. Next stage is final tender. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, we'll get there quickly. Thanks. Quickly. Thanks, Kieran. And again, just on your behalf to thank all the speakers. I think we covered such a wide range of but so clearly presented and with great passion and feeling. And I think if there's anything, you know, besides the detail that we can take out of this session, that it all starts with the vision and strategy and ambition. And if you don't have that, you will never deliver. And underpinning it then, I think the incremental practical application, the building blocks, and underpinning all of that is trust and transparency and also, I'd add good communication, because it is the future. It, it, it's going to happen. And how do we bring along people? I think Barry said people go you know, with their feet if they want to. They, they'll come and get the service. But we have to see, be patient, but also show what that vision is. And we're really, really privileged today, I think, to have four leaders present with such clarity what the future is like and what is possible. So thank you all very much. Thank you.